Hey class, my name is Kevin Ceballos and I want to thank you guys for tuning into my presentation of which I'm going to be talking to you about whether or not we should make biz prisons and or jails uh, privately owned businesses and uh, what I mean by that is having them privately owned as opposed to having any level of government run them uh, whether it be local, state, or federal. Um, in our current society, it's very easy to jump the bullet on defining what or who is good and who or what is bad. When someone is deemed as bad, they're seen to society as nothing but that. A flaw to the system, as some would say. We too often cut the line clear and white without giving a second look into the blurry gray area in between. So this is where the question of ethics comes in. Where does the power between these prisons end? And when do we start recognizing the rights of all the prisoners? Uh, the concept behind privatization is not new to the U.S. whatsoever. It can actually be traced all the way back to the Civil War, where uh, businessmen and farmers alike, they needed to find replacements uh, for labor and work after the, uh, excuse me, after the slaves were freed. Uh, convict leases began in 1868, and the system was in place until the early 20th century. Private prisons, as we know today, were not ushered in until the 1980s which were plagued by enormous jail overcrowding and riots due to war on drugs throughout the nation. Um, this actually became increasingly problematic for the federal, state, and local governments. The first and currently largest private business corporation was actually made during this time. Uh, the name is Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA for short. Since the decade, decade the business has expanded exponentially, and as of today, there are actually 264 correctional facilities that house a grant of almost 99,000 inmates. Um, in 2012, the CCA reached out to 48 other states across the nation as a part of a $250 million plan to operate existing prisons and manage operations. In return, the states required to sign a 20-year contract. This ensured that the company, excuse me, this ensured the company that the state would keep the prison at least 90% full. This, of course, to maximize profit. Uh, the percentage is exactly, <clears throat> excuse me, where one of the biggest problems lies with the business. The state of Louisiana not only leads other states, but the world with the starting 1,619 individuals incarcerated or awaiting trial per 100,000 residents. This number is actually more than Russia, Iran, Brazil, China, and Mexico, just to name a few. To nobody's surprise, the state's governor, Bobby, jumped on his offer a few years ago and handed out most state jails to the company. This raises the question of prisoners and their families alike. Am I in jail because I did something wrong or am I a part of just the quota? Due to the obvious reasons and to the company's advantage, the answer to the question is actually never clear but it is still no reason to be to not be a part of a discussion. If it is written in paper that the jail is to be 90% full, the state will find a way or another for this to happen, even if many of the victims in the system are not guilty. These policies and mindset have trickled down from top to bottom, as it naturally makes police departments more harder on their deputies to bring in people, which makes the police themselves much harder and less lenient to the population. Some argue that prisoners inside these private institutions learn trades or skills that can help them in the future. New Age private prisons are known to negotiate contracts in mainstream society to provide services and goods which are sold to the general public, and the prisoners are paid, by the way, extremely low rates, but nonetheless to learn these skills. These can include anything from learning how to raise fishes on farms, how to grow flowers in a floral shop, growing crops, but some see this as a tactic just as being a facade for the outside eye. As former employee for private company said, I've worked for the named private contractor and it is not a pretty picture. They actually claim that they can serve the inmate population by proposing to work less. Overall, the, overall, the inmates are basically looked upon as human capital, and when prisoners accomplish their long-term goals, falsifying legal documents to extend their full name is executed. This actually needs to be stopped immediately. <clears throat> Where does all the information provided through this essay leave one curious on the subject? On one hand, we have seen that private jails can increase the amount of criminals taken into custody. On the other hand, just how many of these people are not criminals, but rather innocent bystanders to the flawed system? 
We've learned that although privatization is not a new concept, it is becoming more and more acceptable and common as time goes on. But where do these companies draw the line between serving our nation and serving their wallets? It's a thin line in my opinion. <clears throat> we found out that on paper, these private businesses are meant to serve the better, the prisoners, by providing them with skills, work, trades, that they will be able to use for the rest of their lives. But just how corrupt are these systems inside? And are they just a PR stunt for the eyes of society? As this business inevitably grows, just who will be able to stand up to this powerhouse of these companies? But the better question is, who can find themselves in it to stand up to this criminal?